All right. Well, um, I'll just get started then. I'm I'm very uh, very happy you guys invited me to come in and talk about the the Roman catacombs, which is such a cool subject. And normally I don't get to talk about something like this. Uh, Elijah was like, "Hey, tell us about the catacombs and persecution," and I was like, "Heck yes, this is a great subject." Um, usually I'm talking about things that are a little bit more uh, I don't know dull. Um, so I'm going to introduce myself, and then I will just launch right into this. And if I uh, have trouble staying awake you have to forgive me i'm in michigan it's it's almost 10 30 p.m right here so i stayed up late into the evening with my tie on and everything just to just to talk to you guys across the country about the roman catacombs so uh i i hope you'll uh, you'll bear with me so my name is philip campbell mr campbell whatever uh some of you might know me if you're homeschooled or if you have used any of my books um the story of civilization, or if you've uh, taken any classes from Homeschool Connections. So I am a history teacher for Homeschool Connections, which is an online Catholic um, uh, kind of homeschooling curriculum provider. I've been teaching history there for over a decade. So if you've ever taken classes online from Homeschool Connections, you might have encountered me. Uh, I'm also the author of the Story of Civilization series from TAN. So I don't know um, how many of you are homeschooled, if any, but if you've done uh, history, then you may have used some of my books, uh, Story of Civilization. I've authored several other historical books over the years. And I'm the host of a radio program out here in Michigan called Faith Matters with Philip Campbell on Good Shepherd Catholic Radio. And you can find archives of these programs on, uh, on YouTube. Uh, I actually also own my own um, publishing company called Crook and Hill Press, which you can find online. We publish nerdy books of interest to Catholics who are into to history, especially. And um, you can find me online at philipcampbell.net. On Facebook at Philip Campbell Author Teacher, if any of you are on Facebook. Or on YouTube at Mr. Campbell Explains, where, uh, oh gosh, let me shut this off where I post kind of a combination of, of serious historical stuff. And then I post a lot of goofy stuff, history memes and uh, stuff like that. So it's kind of a mixture of the, uh, the serious and the uh, absurd, which is kind of how my personality is. So, um, oh, and uh, if you like nature pictures, <laughs> I, post, I post lots of pictures of nature and Catholic cemeteries and churches on, uh, on my Instagram whatever. So uh, that's a little bit about who I am. I've got my finger in lots of different pies. Uh, and I also used to be a youth group director for many years. So I, I love uh, getting a chance to address uh, youth groups. So, But what we're going to talk about tonight is the Roman catacombs and the uh, persecutions. So um, before we get into the catacombs proper, I want to talk about the attitude towards death that uh, the pagans had in Rome before the Christian church came along, because, you know, we are very accustomed as, as Catholics to thinking of death a certain way. It might be challenging for us to get outside that perspective and imagine how, how pagans might have viewed death and how it was very different from how, how we see it. So if we were to go visit Rome before the time of Jesus, um, we would see a very different attitude towards death and burial. So death amongst the Romans and the Greeks too was viewed as something that could infect or be harmful to the living. And I don't just mean in a medical sense, like Ew, we're going to get sick and diseased from having a corpse around, but I mean like in a superstitious sense, like it was just a bad, bad omen or harmful thing to have uh, the dead around. So there was a strict physical separation between the living and the dead. Uh, people did not want the dead buried or dead bodies in the same areas where the living were. So uh, a, a Roman city would have a boundary around the inhabited area called the pomerium, which is basically a word that means the, the boundary or the threshold. And inside this boundary, you could not have dead bodies. And typically this, this boundary was gonna be like the city limits. So in the city of Rome, for example, all the cemeteries and burials had to take place outside the city because it was only outside the pomerium that the dead could be buried. 
So then outside that boundary, outside the pomerium, it would have been common to see tombs lining the main roads in and out of cities. So if you were coming into Rome in the ancient times, like you're traveling up the Appian Way, coming to the city of Rome, the first indication you were getting near the city was you would start seeing a bunch of cemeteries. The, the, the roads outside of Rome were cluttered with cemeteries because that was the only place where they could bury people was uh, outside that, uh, that pomerium. And you see this in many pre-Christian cultures too, this idea that the dead belong outside the city, that we don't bury the dead amongst us. We don't want you know their spirits lurking around. We don't want angry ghosts. We don't want the bad things that can happen when we surround ourselves with the bodies of the dead. So that's that that was kind of like the pre-Christian attitude toward this. Now, the problem was as Rome grew, and you, if you know your history, you know that Rome started as a, as a small city and then became a city state and then gradually it conquered Italy and then eventually it became the center of a vast multi-continental empire. The issue is that as Rome grew, only the wealthy people, the wealthiest, could afford burial plots outside that pomerium. So you imagine the city of Rome is growing, there's sprawl, people are spreading out, and the land gets more valuable, and only the richest people can afford these burials anymore, right outside the city. So today, if you, if you go on the roads outside Rome, like you see here in this picture, you're going to see the tombs of very wealthy people, um, the, the richest Romans. Um, they were the only ones who could afford these burial plots. So by the time you get to like the late Republic, um, your lower classes, your common people couldn't even afford to be buried anymore at all. Because of course you couldn't bury inside the city and they couldn't be afford to be buried outside the city. I mean, unless they went way out in the country, you know, but, uh, but they didn't want to do that. They want to be buried by, by Rome. So, um, so you start to see them switching to cremation instead. So as we get to the end of the Republic, only the richest people are going to be buried and the regular folk, the plebs, are going to be uh, cremated. And so remains are going to be buried in these little niches called columbaria. And if you know anything about Catholic burial practices, you'll know that to this day, we still use columbaria. Some of you may know that the Catholic Church traditionally frowned upon cremation because it seemed to signify uh, you know, a lack of belief in the resurrection. Uh, and you might know that even today, as a Catholic, you cannot be cremated and then have your ashes scattered everywhere. You can be cremated, but if you're cremated, your ashes are to be put in like an urn or a container and kept together. And so maybe in your Catholic cemetery where you live, you'll have you know, your tombs, but then you'll have something called a columbaria, which might look like a big slab. And there's lots of little uh, like containers where they put the ashes of, of the dead. But anyhow, the Romans did this as well. And uh, so they built these columbaria and the poor would be cremated and put inside of them. But these also, of course, had to be built outside the pomerium. You simply couldn't have dead people inside the city. So the Romans switched to cremation. And here is an example of an ancient uh, Roman columbarium. So you see it would be a small building with all these little niches, and then you could put the urns in the niches, right? And that way you could get the benefit of like a burial in the sense that the, the family could still come to visit the remains of their loved one at a specific place, but because it wasn't taking up so much room, because it was just a small little spot, it was a lot cheaper than buying a whole tomb. Now, how did they afford the land to put these columbariums on? Well, it's kind of cool. They, the, the, the people, the common people would gather together and they would form a club, sometimes called a columbarium club, which was like a funerary guild. It was like a funeral club. It's like a bunch of poor people get together and they say, hey, I got an idea. How about we pool all our money together so we can buy a plot of land so when we die, we can all have a columbarium you know, have our ashes buried in a columbarium together. So these columns, so many people, you know, you look at this picture here, let's say there's 20 or 30 niches here. That might mean that 20 or 30 common people gathered together, they pooled their money and they bought some land and they created a columbarium and they would be a columbarium club, 
a funerary guild. Uh, we're still talking about pre-Christian days here. Now, it wasn't just pooling their money together to, to create these columbarium. They would, they would do commemorations, too. So the members would be commemorated several times a year by banquets in a nearby dining hall or in gardens on top of the columbaria, because the columbaria could be buried underground. It could be like a, a subterranean chamber like you see here. And then maybe once a year, all the members of the columbarium club would get together uh, in a nearby dining hall or in the gardens above, and they would have a commemorative feast in honor of the dead. Here is a here is like a Renaissance era drawing of what some artist imagined a columbarium club party might have looked like. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. I, I doubt this went on like this. Like this shows them feasting. You, you see, they're like they're picking apples and doing things at the same time that they're burying people. And this guy's dead. This guy's pouring wine. I don't know. I think this is just a way to show like this was a funerary club, but. The point is they used to have these picnics, right, in the area of the columbariums, columbaria, sorry. Okay, now, so this is the culture that the, the Christians come into. And Christians and Jews are going to have a little bit different burial practices. So by the beginning of the second century AD, Rome had lots of Jews and Christians living there. Now, Christians and Jews had different beliefs about the afterlife than the Romans did. Christians and Jews believed in the resurrection of the body, so they refused to cremate their dead, because the belief, of course, was that on the last day, God will raise up our physical bodies in a, uh, in a resurrected, glorified form. And in faith in that resurrection, we demonstrate our faith in that by not destroying our physical bodies after death, by not burning them, not scattering the ashes, not leaving them to be eaten by the dogs. You know, we bury them in a specific tomb in a specific place and we reverence the body. And that's part of our faith that on the last day, God will raise up that flesh and, and glorify the body. So the Christians and Jews refused to cremate their dead. They didn't want the, uh, the columbaria. However, we also know that Christians and Jews were usually too poor to be able to afford the expensive burial plots outside the Pomerium. Because, of course, Christian converts in early Rome, many of them were poor, many of them were slaves. Jews, too, in Christian Rome typically weren't, you know, the wealthiest. So you got this dilemma where, you know, we've kind of explained the poor, the common people, they had to have recourse to cremation and to columbaria. They couldn't afford burial plots, but you have Christians and Jews who refuse to cremate for religious purposes, but still are too poor to afford the burial plots. So what are they going to do, right? It, this poses a dilemma. Everybody okay? Can you guys hear me all right? See everything okay? Everything looking good, Elijah? Uh, yeah, it's all good. Actually, it's uh, Elijah's not here. <laughs> It's, oh, uh, okay. Just a friend of his. Uh, All right. Up. But yeah, you're you're coming through. Pretty good. So yeah. Well, yeah. thank you, thank you, imitation Elijah. <laughs> On the <laughs> Zoom, it's it says Elijah, so I thought that was him. But uh, this is just this is this is imitation Elijah. This is Walmart brand Elijah. Great value, Elijah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you're really cool hat guy, but I'm just going to call you great value, Elijah, now. <laughs> okay, so you can see that we've set up, uh, a we've seen what the dilemma is here. Um, Christians needing a specific type of burial, but not being able to afford it. So um, it was much cheaper than, rather than buying tombs, to buy a small plot of land and then dig underneath it. Um, now, the land around Rome was made of something called tufa stone, okay? And this is an example of tufa stone in this picture here at the right. Tufa is yeah. like a volcanic stone that's fairly easy to work with. It's fairly easy to dig, and it's very easy to shape. But it's also remarkably sturdy, 
which is very unique because oftentimes if a stone is really hard, like, like granite or marble, that also makes it difficult to work with. And then sometimes if you get a stone that's really easy to work with, that also means it's not uh, sturdy. But tufa has the benefit of being easy to carve and it's sturdy. So this is how the first catacombs emerged in the second century. The Christians would buy a plot of land but instead of putting a columbaria on it, they would start digging down into it and they would bury their dead. Uh, they, they would dig down in tunnel and bury their dead uh, in these tunnels in the tufa stone. Now, these tunnels became known as catacombs. And there is debate on what the word catacomb means, uh, either among the tombs, uh, catatumbas, or next to the quarry, catacombas. We don't know uh, where the word came from. but um, this was the origin of them, as Christians are trying to find a solution for how they can bury their dead, um, bury their dead in a economically, <laughs> uh, financially feasible manner. So they dig into the soft tufa stone. So, um, so Christians start digging these tunnels out and putting their dead in them. Now, at first, this has nothing to do with persecution. Um, we tend to associate catacombs with persecution, like, oh, this is where the martyrs are buried or the Christians went down here during the persecutions. Um, in the beginning, that wasn't the case. This was just like a, a economic thing, you know, just a cheap way to bury people. Um, we'll see how this ties into the martyrs in a bit. But so Christians, remember, they were part of that Greco-Roman culture that we talked about. They obviously had some very different beliefs from the pagans, but they shared a lot of cultural customs. So the Christians also participated in the funerary celebrations. So if you would have gone to a, a cemetery, you know, an average Roman cemetery outside of Rome, you might have seen various pagan funerary clubs having their picnics. And then you might see the Christians having their own picnic over their, uh, their catacombs. So the Christians did a lot of the same things. They visited the tombs of their deceased. They feasted in the cemeteries just as their pagan counterparts did. On the surface, if you were just, like I said, standing in the cemetery looking at everybody, you'd see all these little different clubs and families having their, their festivals. You wouldn't necessarily tell the difference between the pagans and the Christians just by looking at them. Now, on the surface, this led many Romans, and this is pretty interesting, in the earliest days of Christianity, many Roman uh, observers assumed that the Christians were just another kind of funerary club. They assumed that the Christians were just another uh, like columbarium club, maybe with some eccentric beliefs, but they didn't really realize at first that this was a whole different religion. They just thought it was kind of like a, an eccentric um, funeral club. And there's a great book about this, if you want to read it, called The Christians as the Romans Saw Them uh, by... The author's last name is Wilkin. I can't remember his first name, but it's called The Christians as the Romans Saw Them. And it's a book about how Christians looked through the Romans' eyes. And he shows how the early Romans or the early uh, earliest Christians, the Romans looked at them and was like, oh, is this some kind of weird funeral club? <laughs> like, what is this? Um, but they're doing the same things. They're going to the cemetery. They're having their, their celebrations. Now, for common believers, the funerary feast would have been held above the catacomb in the cemetery, just as the pagans did. Okay, now the catacombs are going to take on a different meaning as we get into the age of the persecutions. So, Christians were persecuted sporadically throughout the empire between like 64 AD when the persecution of Nero broke out and 313, which of course was when Constantine legalized Christianity. So between that period of 64 and 313, you're going to have um, intermittent persecution. The most intense periods were in the mid third century, like from 249 to 260. And then of course, the great persecution of 303 to 313. Most Christian martyrs were going to be killed in these two little windows. Now, a Christian who was killed for his or her faith was called a martyr, of course. And martyr comes from a Greek word that means witness. So um, the idea is that by dying for the truth, you have given witness to the truth of, uh, of who Jesus is. 
you've witnessed to the Christian faith. You've given your supreme witness. So to give your witness or your testimony, right? To give your testimony or your witness, think about like in court, right? If somebody is a witness, they give a testimony. It's like they are testifying to what they believe to be true or what they know to be true. So if you are speaking about the Catholic faith to someone, that is a witness, that is a testimony. Now, being a martyr is like the supreme act of testimony, the supreme witness, where it's not just your words that you're putting on the line, but you're putting your very life on the line. So that is like the supreme witness. Now, the martyrs were held to have a special sanctity, a special holiness, because their ultimate sacrifice gave them a unique conformity to Jesus Christ. Uh, you like they resemble the master in a very special way in suffering for God, just like Jesus Christ did. And so because of this, martyrs were assured a place in heaven. Think about what the gospel says. Whoever will confess me before men, him will I confess before my father. So if you make the ultimate confession, like if you're that dude on the cross there, not only being crucified, but having your feet burned <laughs> for some reason, <laughs> It's not enough to nail him to the cross. We need to set his feet on fire. <laughs> so if you're that dude, you are given the ultimate confession. You are confessing Christ with your life. And Jesus says in the gospel, you are assured a place in heaven. I will confess him before my father. So the early Christians believed, and I mean, we still believe today, when someone is a martyr, that they are like assured a place in, uh, in I, heaven. Can I have you go, go ahead. back? like a minute we completely lost you <laughs> oh okay where did i leave yeah, off sorry about that that's all right what was the last thing i said you were just talking about the importance of martyrs over regular witnesses oh yeah okay so importance of martyrs over regular witnesses um jesus uh Jesus said, the, the gospel says that martyrs are sure to place in heaven, and we believe that too as Catholics. Uh, you look at this passage from Matthew, whoever confesses me before men, him will I confess before my father. So what I was saying is if you are this guy here on the cross, not only being crucified, but having your feet <laughs> set on fire also, I mean, they're killing him, but I don't know. It's not enough to crucify him. We got to set his feet on fire also. But if you're that guy, you are making the ultimate confession, you know, with your life. So the gospel says, if you make that confession, then Jesus says, I will confess you before my father. So the early Christians looked at these martyrs, held them in extreme veneration and believed that they were assured a place in heaven. They were among the saints. They were confessing the son of God around the throne of the lamb before the father. So the martyrs had a special veneration. In fact, the martyrs were like the first saints, like the, the veneration of saints began with the martyrs. So like all the other Christian dead, the martyrs were also entombed in the catacombs, okay? Unlike the, um, the regular Christians, though, their tombs were held in special reverence, okay? You'll notice here is a picture of the original tomb of St. Cecilia. This is the, uh, the famous statue that shows where St. Cecilia's body once, uh, once lay. The tombs of the martyrs were held in special esteem because the martyrs were considered special intercessors before God, right? They were assured a place in heaven. And so they were right up there interceding for the church before the throne of God. And the tomb of the martyr where their physical remains were laying was like a tangible link between the church, uh, between the church um, militant on earth and the church triumphant in heaven. So this was like a gateway between those two worlds where you could uh, kind of have a tangible connection with that martyr interceding before God. So Christians would come to their tombs for the purpose of praying for their intercession. They would come to the tomb here of St. Cecilia or whatever martyr to plead for that martyr's intercession before the throne of God. So the tombs of the martyrs, in effect, became the first Christian shrines where Christians would pilgrimage to those locations for the purposes of asking for special favors of God and begging the intercession of the martyrs. And again, that tomb, that body of the martyr, imagine that body of St. Cecilia laying there, that body itself becomes like a conduit between the world of the living 
and well, I shouldn't say the world of the dead because they're alive in Christ, but you know what I mean? Between this side of the veil and the other side, that martyr's body becomes the conduit that links those two states of the church together. I think that's pretty cool. And so the martyrs' tombs came to held, hold this special significance, and the burial of the martyrs, especially the actual act of entombing the martyrs. Um, they would record exactly what day the martyrs suffered and when they were buried, and it would be a special, uh, it would be like a special date, a special, um, uh, a special solemn celebration. So they would come to the tombs and they would plead for the martyrs' intercession, but they wouldn't just ask with their mouths. They would also carve their uh, their requests on the on the walls around the tomb. They would make graffiti. Uh, so there's lots of tomb graffitos in the catacombs. So these inscriptions would be carved, usually asking for the intercession of the martyrs buried there, or asking the martyrs to remember a loved one. So example here at left. In the catacomb of San Sebastiano, circa 258 AD, you see this inscription, Peter and Paul pray for Victor, okay? So they've made a, uh, a trip to the catacomb and they've carved an inscription on the wall asking St. Peter and Paul to pray for Victor. So you'll see they're not necessarily uh, even asking for the prayers of that specific martyr, just going down to the catacombs. Like they're not at the tomb of Peter and Paul, but they're just in general, when you're in the catacombs among the tombs of the martyrs, this gives you a special proximity to the martyrs in general. It's an act of piety. And so they might be interceding, asking all the different martyrs to intercede for them. Here's some other uh, graffiti from this, these particular catacombs. Peter and Paul intercede for Leontius. Peter and Paul forever intercede for Dativus. Save Martyrius in the Lord. Peter and Paul, keep in mind Alphidios, my son. Peter and Paul, very popular martyrs <laughs> to, to uh, petition, you can see. So you can learn a lot about, and this is something I will tell Protestants when Protestants are like, oh, like uh, these Catholics, like you guys invented, invented praying to the saints in the Middle Ages. It's like, no, go down in the catacombs and look at what the inscriptions are. Look at what these ancient Christians carved, right? You can see what they by looking at the physical remnants uh, of their um, their graffito in the catacombs. And there's so much of this down there. It's all over the place. So remember, we were talking about the funerary clubs and the, um, the feasts commemorating the dead. Um, so it became common for Christians to gather in the catacombs on the anniversary of a martyr's death which was called their birthday. So you might know when it comes to martyrs, we don't celebrate the day they were born. We celebrate the day they died. But the day they died was called their birthday because that's the day they're born into eternal life, right? So you think about uh, like the pagans doing their, their funerary club feasting, right? Well, for a Christian, what is the ultimate, you know, what, what is the ultimate celebration, the ultimate thing you can do in honor of someone? Of course, it's the mass, right? It's the sacrifice of the mass. That is the feast of the lamb, right? That is the, the heavenly banquet of the lamb. So the Christians would honor the martyrs every year by celebrating mass at the tomb. Now, they wanted to get as close to the tomb as possible. So oftentimes they would go right down into the catacomb like you see here in this picture and celebrate a mass right at the martyr's tomb. And sometimes there would be an altar that was constructed um, to where the martyr's tomb would turn into a chapel, but that would come largely uh, later in the Christian era. But they would go right down in there and they would celebrate a mass in honor of the martyr. Now, in what sense was the mass honoring the martyr? Well, uh, in, in two ways. Number one, it was honoring the martyr's life by calling to mind his or her example. So kind of like today, right? On a feast day of some saint, you know, uh, there's like the, the homiletical value where the priest is like, okay, uh, here's St. Patrick. Here's all the, the things he did. Here's all his virtues. Here's all the things we can, you know, learn from St. Therese or whoever, right? You're talking about the the example of the, the martyr or saint. 
But then there's a second way in which the mass honors this individual is that it asks for their intercession, right? So if you're going to mass and that mass is in honor of St. Therese, not only are you being edified by, you know, the example of St. Therese's life, but the mass itself is being offered uh, as a means to petition their intercession, right, before God. Same thing here, mass in honor of the martyrs. They're going down there. They're going down there to call to mind the example of these heroic martyrs who gave their lives for the faith, but also to beg for their intercession before the throne of the Lamb. So the masses are being held right down there on the physical bodies of the martyrs as close as possible. If possible, they're having mass, they're offering the sacrifice right on top of the tomb. And you see this very early on, they just want to have the mass be as close as possible to that martyr's body. That martyr's body, remember, is like a living, it's like a prayer, it's like a conduit right to the throne of heaven. Now, um, why did they want to have the masses set on top of the relics of the martyr? Well, besides what I just said, that the view of the, the martyr's body as being a tangible link to God, there's also this biblical imagery. In Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, it says that the souls of the martyrs, it depicts them as crying out from beneath the altar, crying out, asking God to judge the world. Now, this is interesting. Did, were the early Christians imitating the book of Revelation? The book of Revelation says John sees the martyrs underneath the altar, crying out. So were early Christians looking at this and saying, yes, we are imitating what is in the book of Revelation? Or I think more fascinating, perhaps the book of Revelation was written reflecting a practice that was already going on from the earliest days of Christianity, like maybe... Maybe from the very beginning, the Christians were doing this, celebrating mass over the bodies of the martyrs to call to mind that link between the martyr's body and uh, the power of their intercession in heaven. And maybe that was already going on. And so John, uh, that's why Jesus showed him this vision revelation, because he knew that John would get that reference. I think that's really cool if that would be the fact. We don't really know, though, but there must be some connection to Revelation chapter 6 here. But ultimately, the celebration, I mean, I'm, I know I'm hammering this point a lot, but it's very important. The celebration of Mass on top of the relics of the martyr called to mind the unity between the sacrifice of the Mass and the sacrifice of the martyr and the sacrifice of, of Jesus, which is that same sacrifice of the Mass, right? So it reinforces the link between the living church and the church triumphant, which I just think is totally awesome. How are we doing on time? Oh, we're okay. Good. Okay. So you might know today, even, uh, you know, traditionally all altars were required to contain uh, relics, right? Uh, even today you have reliquary altars, or if your priest travels, you might have seen something like this, an altar stone, where there's a little cavity where you're supposed to deposit the relics. I mean, as the church spread out from beyond Rome, you couldn't always have, you know, you couldn't always have mass literally on top of a body of a martyr. But uh, as time went on, they, they came to distribute relics of the martyrs and put them into the altars. And so um, traditionally, all altars were required to contain relics. And I say traditionally because I have not been able to obtain a clear answer from anyone if this is still the case, like in every single parish. Like if you go to your parish, is there relics of martyrs in the altar? I don't know. <laughs> um, but I know traditionally it was always required for there to be so. Uh, if you've been to any notable basilicas, you might have seen something like this, uh, a reliquary altar, where they don't have the whole body of a saint, but you'll see they'll have a reliquary in the altar where the relics of an important uh, saint or martyr can be kept, and then mass can be offered on top of that. So just demonstrating how even today you still see this concept of that it's ideal, if possible, to offer the mass on top of the relics of a martyr. Okay, so the catacombs, uh, the golden age of the catacombs was during the third and fourth centuries. So during this time, there was various catacomb complexes that were dug out um, significantly, <laughs> like they got pretty big. Like, look at this map 
of the catacombs of Calixtus. This place is huge. I mean, you could get lost down here and never find your way out again. You know, they became underground labyrinths. Now, the catacombs eventually got so big that they came under the control of the popes because the popes alone had the resources available for their upkeep. Um, so, for example, uh, this catacomb, the catacombs of Calixtus, they are named after Calixtus because Pope Zephrinus gave, uh, he took control of the catacombs and entrusted their care to Deacon Calixtus, who was like his job was to care for the catacombs. And Calixtus later became Pope. And so um, it became the catacombs of Calixtus. I've seen the skull of Calixtus, by the way, in a, uh, in a traveling reliquary exhibit of the Medici. He belonged, his, his skull was later taken by the Medici family of Florence. And I went to see an exhibit of the Medici reliquaries and I saw the skull of Calixtus and it had a big hole in it where the executioner hit him with an ax or something, right? This head, you could still see the hole, it was brutal. Uh, so how many martyrs were there? I mean, these tombs are getting huge. Uh, were these all for martyrs? Uh, no, no. I mean, the martyr tombs were the most important ones, but not every single tomb in the catacombs was a martyr tomb. Um, early medieval writers tended to exaggerate the number of martyrs, claiming hundreds of thousands or even millions of martyrs. These numbers are very unrealistic. <laughs> and sometimes these numbers have got passed on history. I was just reading a website yesterday. It was like, there was like 3 million martyrs. I was like, you know, the whole Roman Empire only had like, you know, 15 million people or something. It's not like, you know, 25% of the population was martyrs. So uh, the medieval writers like to exaggerate the numbers. So the hundreds of thousands, millions, that's a bit too large. Now, on the other hand, you get up to the Enlightenment, anti-Christian writers tried to downplay the martyr stories. They tried to say that these were all embellishments or fabrications. And they said the real number of martyrs was very low, like as low as 3,000. I think that is, is much too low. Um, the problem in, in looking at this is that martyr stories only gain prominence if the martyr perished in the midst of the community, right? You have a situation like this, a woman being fed to the lions in the midst of you know the whole town. Obviously, this woman is going to get a lot of notoriety, but you also had martyrs who were killed alone or while fleeing, you know? Um, periods of persecution could be very chaotic. Many Christians fled. Um, some of them were apprehended and killed outside their community, right? Like imagine that you're in Rome and you flee from Rome and let's say you flee to uh, Ephesus where nobody knows you. And then somehow you get handed over in Ephesus and you get killed, but nobody knows who you are, right? Your story isn't gonna get written down. Uh, so if you die in obscurity, if you die outside your community, it's a lot likely that the martyr story is going to be recorded. So even though you know we know that there's several thousand uh, martyrs that we know of for sure, you have to assume that there was more martyrs than the ones that the record survived, right? You see what I'm saying? you have to assume that more than just those were killed because obviously some records perished, some tombs were destroyed, many people were killed, uh, like I said, that weren't very well known. So there's going to be obviously more than what was recorded. So I think a reasonable estimate for the total number of, number of martyrs killed throughout Rome up to 313 is probably 20,000 to 30,000 Christians, probably. That's my estimate. Now, the catacombs got so big, eventually, uh, I mentioned that they required full-time management. So there was a guild that was formed called the Fossores, or the Diggers, the, uh, uh, that was formed to manage them. So you might have a guy like Deacon Calixtus. He is the cleric in charge of the catacombs, and then he's going to appoint um, uh, somebody called a Fossor. Um, you'll have a guild of diggers, and the head of this guild is going to be the chief Fossor or sometimes he's called a mensor. Um, but this is going to be like the catacomb chief, like the groundskeeper of the catacombs, the cemetery master. It was um, a position that combined the skills of an engineer and a master builder who would administer the work on the catacombs. So originally this was a humble position, but over time, the, uh, the benefits and privileges of the fasores grew 
that by the end of the fourth century, they became uh, almost wealthy property managers and vendors of the tombs called patronis. This um, image you see here is a sketch of a uh, of a carving that you see in the um, in one of the catacombs of a fossor named Diogenes. Right. This is, I think, this is his own tomb. Diogenes Fossor, Diogenes the Fossor, in peace was buried Octavro Calendis Octavris in the Calends of October. This is the tomb of a Fossor. And see, you can see this iconography. He's got the pickaxe showing that it was his job to dig the tombs. So there's actually a guild in charge of managing the tombs. And we're talking about when they got big, right? Um, the catacombs are embellished with lots of art. So a common image in the catacombs you see is the orans posture. This is a person praying like this with their hands out. Early Christians did not pray like this. This, this gesture came from the Middle Ages. The early Christians prayed like this with their hands extended. So if you would have gone to mass in the early church when people were praying, they'd have their hands extended like this. And this survives in the mass to this day, right? You'll notice that when the priest prays on behalf of the people, like when he says the pater noster, you'll notice that he puts his hands like this. But when the priest is praying just between himself and God, puts his hands like this. But when praying on behalf of the community, the hands go like this. Um, so pay attention to that next time you go to Mass. And this is true regardless of what form of the Mass you go to. If you go to the traditional Latin Mass, you go to the Novus Ordo, you'll see the same thing, that, that when the priest is praying on behalf of the people or with the people, his hands go to the ancient Oran's posture. Anyhow, you'll see this image a lot in the catacombs. Um, this represents the church praying, the church at prayer. Usually it's a woman. Um, so it just it is a, a metaphor of the praying church, right? The church praying uh, in the tombs. Uh, you'll also see images of the Blessed Virgin, a uh, very early art of the Virgin and Child. Um, and these are the prophets. We don't know which prophets, maybe Elijah and maybe Micah, because those prophets are the ones that, that predicted the birth of Christ. And you'll see lots of pictures of Christ, the Good Shepherd. So the earliest images of Jesus in Christian art don't depict him with the beard and the long hair. They depict him as a clean-shaven Roman shepherd. So this is Jesus Christ here as the good shepherd, where he says the good shepherd goes and finds the one sheep that has gone astray and puts it on his shoulders and brings it back rejoicing. This is Jesus finding the lost, the, the, the sinner. Here's another, um, another good shepherd image. You see, same image. He's a clean-shaven Roman lad with a sheep on his back. He's like a Roman country boy, as they envisioned him. Here's another one. See? So this is a very common theme. Jesus Christ, the good shepherd. So how did the use of the catacombs change after Christianity became legal? So in AD 313, of course, Constantine issues the Edict of Milan, uh, and more and more Christian churches are going to be built, you know, because you have Christian churches before, but you also have a lot of house churches and stuff. But now that it's legal, more and more churches are going to be built. Now, because of the great veneration in which the early church held the martyrs, um, once we move into the age of, of Christendom, the church is going to think, you know, it's more ideal to put these martyr tombs in the churches um, or to build the churches right on top of the tomb itself. So just like they wanted the masses over the tombs, they wanted the churches on the tombs. And if they couldn't get the churches on the tombs, sometimes they would take the body out of the, the, the catacombs and put it in the church. So um, churches would be constructed, if possible, over the martyr tombs. And usually in such a way that the altar itself was directly over the tomb, okay? And this is what you see in St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. The high altar is directly over the tomb of St. Peter. So you see in a lot of these tombs something called fenestele. And if anybody knows Latin, you know your word finestra for window, right? Um, a fenestele, that means a little window. 
Okay. So in these ancient uh, churches, like this one here, Santa Maria della Rotonda in Sicily, one of the earliest churches in Sicily, the altar will have a little window called a fenestella, and that window is like a um, is like a shaft that goes down to the tomb. Okay, and it's kind of cool. What the faithful could do is they could come to this fenestella and they would dangle. Uh, they would dangle their little religious trinkets down the hole on a string. Um, so you ever gone to a reliquary, right? You see people take their rosaries, they touch it to the relic, they touch their scapulars to the relic, right? They touch their objects to the, the relic. Well, in the Fenestella, they would come and they would have little crosses or little items, and they would have like a, a rope, and they would dangle it down, you know, uh, dangle it down the shaft until they could feel it touch the martyr tomb, and that would like, you know, sanctify the, the little object, and then they'd wheel it back up like fishing, <laughs> you know, like they're, like they're fishing in the martyr's tomb. No, no, that's not literally what they're doing. But, um, but you know what I mean? They're dangling it down until they feel it touch the tomb. And now it's had contact with that sacred, with that sacred remains. And then they can bring it up and that's how they would get like a blessed, uh, a blessed cross. So if you're ever in an ancient church in Europe, in Italy, you see something like this, these little windows, these are called fenestele, the, the little, uh, windows to give access to the tombs below. Now, of course, you can't always build your church right over the tomb of a martyr. Like, think about how extensive that, that catacomb map I showed you of the catacomb of Calixtus. That was huge. And these are many stories down, you know. So you definitely cannot always get your altar right on top of where it needs to be. Um, in many cases, there's not going to be a way to get access to that martyr's body unless you actually go down there, right? So. After the time of Constantine, Christians no longer had to bury their dead in the catacombs uh, because obviously now that Christianity is the religion, they don't have that taboo against burying bodies in the city anymore. So now there's much more options for burial. Christians can have cemeteries right next to the church like you guys probably do in your parish. You probably have a cemetery. Um, so they could bury again or for, for saints could be buried right in the churches. So they no longer had to use the catacombs. So burials declined through the 300s, and by 400s, nobody was being buried in the catacombs anymore. But the catacombs were still getting used. They were getting visited uh, because Christians from elsewhere would come to Rome on pilgrimage to see the catacombs and pray in the tombs of the martyrs. So these were the first Christian pilgrims, right? People who are coming, from, coming to Rome, coming from far away. To, to venerate the tombs of the martyrs that they had heard about in the, their liturgies and in the stories. So a tourist industry sprouts up around Rome to cater to these pilgrims. Uh, you'll find uh, you, they, they used to publish little like handbooks, little tourist guides where you could come to Rome and, and these ancient pilgrims could get a little books saying, like, hey, you want to visit the tomb of Pope Calixtus, you're going to want to visit the tomb of Cecilia. Here's how you get to them. And it told them, where to go and, and how to get there. And then you'd have little pilgrim hostels, places that serve food. You know, it was like a little tourist industry for these early pilgrims. Now, in fact, um, in several languages, uh, like French, Spanish, and other Romance languages, the word for Rome became synonymous with the word for pilgrim. Uh, so in Old French, you have a word, romier. That's like a Romer, one who's going to Rome. That's a pilgrim. Or in Spanish, Romero, that's a pilgrim. That's, that's the word for pilgrim. It's uh, someone who's going to Rome because Rome was the original pilgrimage destination way before Jerusalem or, you know, Compostela or Lourdes or any of these places. It was Rome that people wanted to go to see the catacombs. St. Jerome uh, recounted how as a student, when he was a young man in Rome, on Sundays, he would go visit the tombs of the apostles and martyrs with his classmates. And he said, quote, we would enter the galleries dug into the bowels of the earth. Rare lights coming from above land attenuated the darkness a little. We would proceed slowly one step at a time, completely enveloped in darkness. That's such a neat image. St. Jerome, as a, as a young man with his study companions, visiting the catacombs on a Sunday to see the tombs of the saints. That is cool. Now, as you can see from the picture, people still do this today, right? You can still go to the catacombs today, obviously, and do the same thing. Now, 
Um, the fact that the catacombs are in such good shape as they are today is due largely to the efforts of one pope, Pope Damasus. Pope Damasus uh, was pope from 366 to 385. He loved the martyrs, loved the catacombs, and he ordered underground chapels built throughout the catacombs for worship. So um, there were so many pilgrims coming to the catacombs. He feared that... Um, uh, that there was damage being done to the catacombs, that the original locations of the martyrs was their tombs were being obscured, that just there'd be too much chaos from all these people coming through. And so he had uh, he had their locations recorded. He had some of the more popular tombs turned into chapels um, to make it more conducive for early Christ for Christians to worship down there. So he beautified many of them with slabs of marble, pillars, artwork, etc. And he had many inscriptions carved upon the tombs or in the chapels of the martyrs, praising those who were buried there. Now, in many cases, the only reason we know who was ever buried in a specific tomb is because of these little poems that Damasus had inscribed upon them. So, like, you find a tomb, and the only clue to who was ever buried there is a poem that Pope Damasus had carved on the tomb. Uh, and originally, you know what this is for? You guys ever been to a museum, right? You go to a museum and you're looking at a painting and then you know there's the little plaque on the side of the painting that's like you are looking at a painting done by blah 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 and it says you know what you're looking at you guys have probably seen those that's exactly what damasus was doing he was making these little inscriptions for the tourists so they would know what they were looking at well you know those inscriptions are still there and they tell us okay this was the tomb of saint cecilia this was the tomb of saint sebastian or whatever so it's kind of cool. If it wasn't for this Pope and his love of the martyrs, we would probably not know where a lot of who was buried in a lot of these places. All right. Sadly, that age did not go on forever. Um, during the sixth century, the lands around Rome were plundered repeatedly by the Goths during the Gothic Wars. They, they, they went throughout Italy. They plundered the catacomb chapels. The tombs were desecrated. And the Christian pilgrims who still dared to make the journey took advantage of this chaos to remove the relics of the martyrs for their own churches and devotions. And um, did they steal them? It depends. I mean, I'm sure if you were to ask those Christians, hey, are you stealing those relics? They would say, no, we're moving them to a safer location. Uh, we're not stealing them. We're forcibly relocating them without permission. <laughs> That's how the Christians viewed it. Um, but also they were kind of like, oh, you know, this, this relic would be pretty boss in my own church. You know, I, I'm, from, uh, I'm from Augsburg up in Germania, and I would love to have uh, the leg of St. Sebastian in my church. And you know what? Eh, Rome is all full of chaos. There's Goths rampaging around the catacombs. I'm just going to take it for safekeeping, and I'm going to move it up to Augsburg. So a lot of the relics got taken, got broken up, moved around. Now, uh, the popes were almost powerless to stop this, powerless in the face of the pillages of the, the, the Goths, the barbarians, powerless to stop the, uh, the, the hordes of pilgrims who would pick away at the relics. So... By, we get to the, by the time we get to the 800s, the Pope said, you know what, the catacombs are too extensive for us to protect anymore. Um, so for safekeeping, they ordered the removal of all the relics of the martyrs and the saints to the city churches for security reasons. So when the Pope realized this had gone on long enough, they couldn't secure the catacombs anymore. They went through and they removed all the relics, all the bodies of the martyrs, and relocated them to the city churches named for the martyrs for security reasons. So now those Fenestelli windows, they don't go down to anything. They go down to the old tomb, but there's no body down there anymore. The bodies have all been removed. Now, once the bodies were removed, there was no longer any reason to visit the catacombs, or, or as the early Christians viewed it. Um, so on the contrary, with few exceptions, the catacombs were abandoned entirely. And in the course of time, uh, landslides and vegetation obstructed and uh, hid the entrances to the other catacombs so that the very traces of their existence were lost. 
In fact, during the latter Middle Ages, the Romans themselves didn't even know where the catacombs were. Maybe with a few exceptions, I think there was one or two that were so well known that the Romans still knew where they were. But if you were to go to Rome in like the year, you know, 1250, the Pope himself didn't even know where the catacombs were. They'd been lost entirely because there was no longer a reason to go there. Early pilgrimage, and I can't stress this enough, first millennium of Christianity, pilgrimage is so tightly, tightly connected with the bodies of the saints that if the body wasn't there, there was no reason to go. It's not like today. Today, I'd be like, oh, I don't care if there's bodies there. I want to go see the catacombs. I want to see the art. I want to wander through the tunnels. I want to, you know, bask and pray in the spot where the stuff used to happen. No, for early Christians, it was like, no body. Why am I going there? I want to go where the body is, right? I want to go where the, where the relics are. So uh, it wasn't until the 1800s that many of the catacombs were rediscovered, um, largely under the work of a Vatican archaeologist named Giovanni Battista de Rossi. And he discovered a lot of catacombs. His greatest discovery was finding the catacomb of Calixtus in a Roman vineyard. Gosh, imagine discovering that thing. You remember the map I showed you earlier that was just huge? Imagine finding that thing. Oh, God, that's my, that's my dream to find something like that. Uh, De Rossi found it by, he was scrounging around in a garden and he found like a, an inscription uh, that said like, uh, you know, uh, rest you know, in rest. peace Cornelius or something. And he was like, what? And then he thought this might be Pope Cornelius. And then he started digging around and he found that there was a catacomb under there. Uh, and he discovered that huge network of catacombs that had once, that, that he found the bodies of nine, or, or the tombs, sorry, not the bodies, the tombs of nine popes. He thinks there had at one time been 16 popes buried there, nine popes and 50 martyrs in 12 miles of corridor. And ironically, the, the sarcophagus of Pope Damasus was there as well. Imagine finding that dude. You stumble down there. What'd you find today? Oh, 12 miles of corridors, 50 martyr tombs, nine popes. Ooh. This is like on par with the discovery of King Tut's tomb, but I just don't think people know about it. Uh, this is a neat picture. When he found it, uh, he went to show Pius IX, and Pius IX was very much into the catacombs, and he brought Pius IX. You can see Pius IX uh, in the white robes there in the center of the picture. De Rossi literally brought the Pope down into the catacombs and, uh, and showed him to him. Cool story. So there are no more bodies in the Roman catacombs today. No, all the bodies are gone. They've all been removed. Uh, as I said, moved up. Um, there are, but that's just the Roman catacombs, okay? See, Christians didn't just do this in Rome. They did this in many other places. They did this in London. They did this in Paris. They did this in countless cities across the Middle East. I mean, I've been to, I've been to uh, the Netherlands and I went to the city of Utrecht. Have any of you ever heard of the city of Utrecht? I went to the main square in the city of Utrecht there's a, a catacomb in there. I didn't go down in it because they wanted 25 euros. Uh, <laughs> I, I wish I would have gone now. But at the time, I was like, 25 euros? I'm sorry. Eh, uh, maybe another time. Um, that's like $37 or something. Um, <laughs> anyhow, I'm kicking myself now. But um, many cities in the Middle East, and in many of these places, especially in the Middle East, some of these catacombs haven't even been explored. Like I was reading in the city of Odessa, which I think is in northern Syria, it's believed that there's extensive catacomb networks under the city that have just never even been excavated before. So, um, you know, there's still opportunity to make these sorts of discoveries uh, out there. And the catacombs are all going to be different. They're not all in the Tufa stone of, of Rome, but, you know, they're still, uh, they're still the subterranean networks under the city. Paris is very famous for its catacombs. And you might have seen these pictures uh, in the French catacombs where there's the bodies of dead, you know, where there's still skulls everywhere, <laughs> you know, that have been buried there in the early Middle Ages. So there's a lot that remains to be explored for the enterprising um, archaeologist. All right, that's it. That's my presentation on the catacombs and the martyrs. And uh, 